you know, the big thing in our world and the big thing for the psychology of the deal is not just doing it yourself. Let's start there. Okay. If you're in the middle of it, you're too emotional. Right. You need to have either a, a mm -hmm. team of individuals, not too much of a team because too many voices can make it bad, but you need to have someone on your side. If you don't have a trusted advisor navigating this with you, you cannot make the right decision. In a deal, momentum and inertia matter a lot. When you have a buyer, you have a seller, you have an investor, you have an organization that you're looking for, mm -hmm. you know, in the entertainment field of someone investing or making an investment in you, mm -hmm. momentum matters. So back to what I was saying. What's up, what's up, what's up, friends, family, and fans? Welcome to Life on Podcast. This is where we listen and inspire friends and entertainment. And everyone. That's right, because life happens to everyone. You may recognize this smiley face over here. Mr. Lee Heisman, welcome back, sir. What's yeah, up, yeah. So you were with us. Don't try to do that. It's been over nope, a year. I'm going to impress myself. <laughs> we're going to go with episode 146. <laughs> And I believe it was called Comfort Killer because yes. we're talking about being out of your comfort zone. Yes. Can I get a hand clap yeah, sound? Hand clap sound, clap sound effects. Thank you very right, much. Yeah. No, it's not in my notes at all. Right it's not so in my notes. If you did, that was awesome. Welcome back, sir. So if you guys want some um, long background, because we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on background today, but go back to 146. Listen to this guy, uh, an M and A expert, and we're going to break down what M and A means. Savant by company name and by. Brain power, whatever you call it, whatever. And drop some toothpicks. On Fellow the Eagles fan. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, welcome back, bro. Yeah, yeah. Thank welcome you. back, back. So the reason why I brought you back, I'm gonna jump right into it. We, uh, so you do M and A. We're gonna talk about what that means: mergers, acquisitions. I'll let you expound. But your bottom line is you're constantly doing and making deals every day, all day. Literally a sensei in the field. If I say, is that all right to say? Oh, yes, sir. Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that was P.I. Is it P.I.? Uh-oh. Is it P.I.? Politically incorrect. Sorry. Oh, yeah, there it is. Because we were talking about P.E. and P.I. Yeah, like, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding with you, bro. So, yeah. So, that's, so that's why I have you on here. So, let's break it down again. So, you're a multipreneur. And I want to talk about that. Because a lot of people tell me, I'm a multi-entrepreneur. Just starting a business. <clears throat> doesn't make you an entrepreneur. I mean, like, technically. But if you don't grow or scale the businesses, are you really an entrepreneur? <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, do you just own a bunch of jobs? So, but you're truly an, a multipreneur, right? That's true. Can you break down some of the businesses and some of the uh, the sectors that they're sure, in? Sure, sure. I'll give a little background real quick. Mm -hmm. uh, and Johnny and I were talking about this earlier. So, 25 years ago, I just turned 53, so I'm an old man still. Nice. There's a lot of experience there, a lot of wisdom here. Yeah. Uh, but own A lot of lost cartilage. <laughs> a lot, lot, of, lot of pain and <laughs> suffering. And, and then, but really, the degree of pain and suffering is inversely proportional to the success that you have as an entrepreneur. Sure. So if you're a one entrepreneur or entrepreneur, but you haven't experienced pain and suffering, you're kind of what you said, Stone. Yeah. Not really that entrepreneur yet. But I will say I've gone from I own, owned a commercial printing company in mm -hmm. the uh, in industrial space. So from blue collar, gray collar, white collar employees, we grew to 120 employees here in Marietta. Nice. Uh, was able to exit out of that business, opened up a technology firm, a computer company, managed service provider called Savant years ago. Was able to exit out of that and you know owned a firearms training company. You know, Johnny and I have been out on the range shooting, of mm -hmm. course. Uh, our you know, more than a million downloads of our Shrimp Tank podcast. Mm -hmm. uh, so the list goes on and on. Just, Real estate. It's been, uh, owned a uh, coordinate property management. If you remember, what's how did we get coordinate, that name? Do you remember? I forgot. I don't remember either. Yeah, so anytime my partner and I would say the word coordinate over the years, and that's why we named it, right? You got a coordinate, coordinate. the mushroom belt. That's right. That's where the mushroom belt came from. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Boomerang. Shout out to John Witherspoon. All right, so, uh, you know, and people always say, you know, there's Eddie Murphy movies or, yeah. you know, all, all those movies. They always say, you know, every line from it. And I've always said, it's not that I memorize every line. I said, back in the day, there were only three or four movies released in a year. So it's right, not like you had to remember a hundred movies. It was just right. three movies. And you did something in construction too, right? That is correct. A complete concrete and hardscape. So a landscape and concrete company. So my well. point being is when I'm talking about the guy knows what he's talking about, where businesses are concerned, he knows what he's freaking talking about. That's true. My, that's my well, point. Well, yeah, I can segue, you know, you know what you're talking about by the failures because, uh, you know, selling my own businesses to those private equity, to those mm -hmm. M&A, you know, the, in the mergers and acquisition space, mm -hmm. I made so many mistakes. You still do well selling your business. Mm -hmm. But when you know you don't know what you don't know, right. and I will tell you the mistakes that I made selling my businesses forced myself and my business partner Ted Jenkins, you know very yep. very well. Ted. It kind of pushed us into this role of ESL Exit Stage Left Advisors, where we represent and we do the deal and what we're going to talk about today. So basically, <clears throat> you have a particular.
particular set of skills. <laughs> skills that you've acquired over a long career. Was that was that good? <laughs> no, was that pretty good? Impressive. <laughs> that was good. I'm not impressed. <laughs> but, so, so this whole so Are you gonna, you're going to dub in Liam Neeson's Oh no, 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 I'm going to just no, I'm going to put his face and keep my voice is what I'm going to do. So you, all this buying and selling, I'm going to let you go, but you become no, this m and expert thing. But I just want to ask this one thing. Don't forget it. You keep saying, I started this, I exited. I started. I, is that kind of the goal of an entrepreneur, like to start a business to sell it? So I will tell you, there's two types of businesses. You're starting it to sell it or you're starting it for a lifestyle business. And running yeah. the business and operating it, those are two different trajectories. Ooh, and that's what, you know, that. when you open a business with respect, you're just, just trying to keep your head above water. You're still in the middle of the ocean and you're just treading water. Mm -hmm. But as your business evolves, you have to make a determination. Do I eventually want to exit this business and grow this for that trajectory and that path? Or do I just like the business the way that it is? I got a great staff. I'm built a great culture here. I'm not interested. This is going to be a lifestyle business. So there is that inflection point. You know, years ago, I keep referencing my age. I used to go to the bookstore and people are like, what's a bookstore? What store? are those? Yeah, yeah, right? Like I would dial it with my rotary phone. Barney's and Noble. Yeah. yeah. Barney's. <laughs> Exactly, big purple <laughs> elephant at the store. It's yep. weird. Uh, and I, I used to go to the bookstore, and there was a book called Choose Your Own Adventure. I don't yes. know if you remember yep. that. Yes! Yep. Oh, my gosh. What was that? Eighth grade I was in when those books came out. So what would you would do for exactly. those older than fifty? You were like right? two, <laughs> exactly. I love. Oh, wow. Well, you would you would get the book right, yep. and mm -hmm. you would go, and I I'm this you know soldier going yeah. down this hallway, oh and gosh. it would say if you want you remember this yeah. if you want to make a right down the hallway, turn go to, to page, page yep. fifty six. Mm -hmm. If you want to make a left, go to page eighty two. So you got so much more from the book yep. than just I'm reading from page one to two hundred. Yep. Yep. So I always think of that when I think about someone's career path and their trajectory. Nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So when it comes to being an actual entrepreneur, the difficult thing about running a business is the not knowing what you're doing part to me. But it's also the most exciting and thrilling part because you're learning on the way. Um, I've owned two and my partners have owned hundreds. The one thing that I've seen through those processes is that when you make those mistakes, those mistakes tend to never repeat themselves the exact same way. Um, before we actually get into ESL and all of the things that are encompassing what you're doing now, how do you actually take that information from those mistakes and apply them when they're never really directly applicable after it happens? Because the, the problems evolve, the situations are different, the sectors are different. Yeah, no, very, very good question. So. Pain, the only way you grow, and you know, we talked about this earlier, right? The reality is there's so much information out there from so many people and experts. Who do you really listen to? Mm -hmm. right. And really, once you find someone that you like, you got to lock in, right? You just can, you got to do your job and narrow the field down of, of this pool of experts that you want to listen to because you're going to get too much varying information. Right. But I will tell if, if you're listening to me, the only way you grow is through pain. Anytime something's good, you're not going to grow, right? So it's just scar tissue built up. There might not apply one plus one equals three or four or that exact situation, Johnny, that you were speaking of. Mm -hmm. May not rear its exact head, but if you can look at the application, it's really not just this happened to me. How do I not replicate this again? It's more this happened to me, whatever the circumstance for, for viewers out there. This was painful. I don't know what to do. And how are you going to react to that? Would, you, you, would you say that that pain and not being able to adjust to it or evolve from it is the reason why some people don't actually become entrepreneurs? 100%. So it's, it's, does, does that pain stop you? Do you just stop going forward where the path is not clear? Do you just stop and say, look, this is too painful, too much risk. I'm not willing to keep going and just believe in myself. It's really easy to look back and go, oh, look at all the pain I was through for this journey that I made it to this successful spot. But in the middle of it, if you don't see a clear path forward, it's you still putting your head down, believing in your effort mm -hmm. and muscling through it. There is no other way around it. You're walking into a dark cavern. You can't mm -hmm. see in front of you, and you have to keep taking a next step and next step and next step. Mindset. Yep. It's, all, mindset. it's all mindset, which is one thing I wanted to ask you about. When you're doing these deals, there's a, there's a psychology aspect to it, right? Um, it's kind of like a chess game. You know, you got to be strat you know, strategic and, you know, kind of got to know two moves ahead and kind of anticipate what this person is thinking, what they're doing. Like, how much is that involved in let's let's unpack some of those strategies. Like, how, how much is that involved in what you do? Like the whole like psychology of doing the deal. So, Stone, I'm fortunate to have Molly Ryan uh, working with me now for the past the year. The Molly Ryan? The Molly Ryan Heisman, actually. Whoa. But we don't tell many people her last name. I like her to establish her own relationship. Of course. Wow. Uh, at our firm, we have 10 full-time people. But just today, and I'm going to admit she's never seen the movie Training Day. She is now going to watch it. 
Okay. But let me explain why. I, yes. She said, look at all the moves we have to think ahead. And then mm -hmm. I quoted Denzel, and I said, this ain't checkers, this is chess. Mm -hmm. And it's funny you mention that, because that was one of my favorite lines from yeah. Training Day, amongst many others, of, co right. of course. <laughs> but your question specifically was the psychology of the piece, right? It's, mm -hmm. you know, the big thing in our world, and the big thing for the psychology mm -hmm. of the deal is not just doing it yourself. Let's start there. Okay. If you're in the middle of it, you're too emotional. Right. You need to have either a, a team of individuals, not too much of a team because too many voices can make it bad, but you need to have someone on your side. And this isn't just work, someone working with us at ESL, but if you don't have a trusted advisor navigating this with you, you cannot make the right decision. Mm. I know that unequivocally. Mm. Too emotionally involved. You, you, you can't see the forest through the trees. You're not exactly going to make the, the most subjective or non-subjective qualitative decision and not be subjective about it. Now, I'm glad you actually said that because trying to make a qualitative opposed to quantitative because you're just if you have a research mind, you can do everything off of just what the analytics say. The data, 100 um, percent. But hmm. there also has to be a, a mix of creativity in, in, in some of that. Is that where your advisors come into play if if you don't have that mindset? Is, so to is, be frank, oh, it's a great call, my friend. So, you know, my business partner, Ted, and you know him well, and if people don't know him out there, Ted Jenkins, extraordinary, analytical, qualitative mind. I'm the opposite. I have no qualitative features and qualities in my head. I'm all gut feel. <laughs> Which is no, why I, we have him on the podcast, ladies no, and gentlemen. Because he has no qualitative <laughs> No quantitative ability. Fun, no fun. I can analyze high level, uh -huh. but I'm a gut. And they're in a deal, guys, for most people, and we gotta take a step back, but in a deal, momentum and inertia matter a lot. When you have a buyer, you have a seller, you have an investor, you have an organization that you're looking for, mm -hmm. that person making an investment in your company, mm -hmm. that person buying your organization, you know, in the entertainment field of someone investing or making an investment in you, mm -hmm. momentum matters. Mm -hmm. And those buyers don't wanna see too many hiccups along the way. You have to lean into that momentum. So people but, aren't looking to get your train out of the station. They're looking to hop on a moving train. 100%. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, and you got to let the train go at the right time. Mm -hmm. You got to sit back. It's all about timing. This is what I've noticed. You know, uh, this is a big piece for entrepreneurs, business owners, and people in general. They're always thinking, and clients that I'm dealing with have very successful businesses, and it's amazing being around some of the most successful people. Guys, I'm going to step back real quick and just mm -hmm. share with sure. you. Uh, we have over 750 intimate mm -hmm. relationships with private equity companies, family offices across the country. And these firms, just to give you context, the small firms have values of one to three billion with a B. Mm -hmm. The medium sized firms are four to eight billion and the larger firms are nine plus billion dollars. So mm -hmm. we're dealing with a very high sophisticated <coughs> level of buyer. Family offices are very similar, private equity investors, that's the pool what we're dealing with. When I'm dealing with business owners, and these are people that are very successful in their business, What's so amazing is most owners want to think about seven, eight, ten steps down the road. And when you start to work on the psychology of a deal, every single owner, and by the way, if you're out there listening to this and you're thinking, well, I'm thinking of the next five steps and ten steps, and that's the way an entrepreneur thinks, mm -hmm. I have to step them back and say, we're not thinking of step two through ten. I got to get through step one first. Right. Once we check that box, we then have to get to step two. And you look at the faces of these entrepreneurs that have lived decades of their life growing a business, thinking of the next 10, 20, 30 steps, and you say, there's no point in going two through 10 or two through 20 if we don't get one done. Right. Right. So I can't build that second or third layer of the house to like pour a good foundation. Mm -hmm. Most entrepreneurs and people don't like thinking like that. They want to map out the next year or two of their world. Does the Go for it. I was going to say, and just, but that's the grassroots 101 on getting that momentum and inertia 100 that talking about. Well, I can't get momentum if I'm flailing out of control. Right. How for do we start rolling down the hill You know, if we don't know what direction we're going in and right. if there's going to continue to be a hill? So we really have to strategize and map out the direction you're mm -hmm. going. But you can't do that on your own because you're in the middle of the war running your business. Right. Right. You're right. in the middle of a deal if you're an entertainer going, look, I've got to produce my next music. I've got to do my next gig that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I can't even think of doing a deal on that was the impetus for us opening this because we were the same. We were running our businesses, running our careers, and a buyer swoops in and says, all right, cool, I'm gonna make an offer for you, and you say, oh, I'm so overjoyed. Mm -hmm. And then you get taken advantage of. It's yeah. such a catch-22, though, like in so, music, especially music nowadays, because you have to build the inertia and you have to build the momentum, but you can't do that until step one is done, and you're like, but you need a team for that. But then, especially in music, it's hard to get a team mm -hmm. if you don't have the momentum. So you kind of forced to do it all. And it's, but don't it's you have managers in, in the entertainment? Well, that's and that's a good point though, because managers that are truly, truly worth their salt, they're looking at look. I have to invest all this time, maybe possible financial resources, definitely relational resources. I have to pour all this into what a rock that needs a push. 
I'm looking for someone that's already moving. Or I'm going to argue with this and, you know, just use our organization. We're success fee based only. So consider if I'm working with you as a business owner or a talent, as we'll call it, I'm investing in you as well because I'm not making anything till I close a transaction. So it's so, so funny. But you have yeah. to choose a manager or representation that aligns their goals. A lot say, well, I'm going to charge you a fee and I'm going to put a yeah. retainer down. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with that. Probably a lot of organizations work like that. That's not what we do. That's not how I like it because I align our goals together. But I'm also interviewing our clients prior to me taking them on because right. if they're just a right. stagnant rock, then I probably am. I'll give advice on how they smooth their corners, sure. how they get their ball rolling and that rock rolling down the hill. But I might not take them on. Yeah. So finding that representation is so important. I, you took a step back and I don't know if this is making me take a step back or making me jump too far ahead. Let me know. Um, Creating the problem and supplying the cure has a lot to do with how you control Big that pharma. momentum. Big pharma. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> um, when, when you're trying to generate that inertia, because I mean, and you talk about it in your breakdown that you sent me, which was freaking phenomenal. Even though, it's too a, nice. yeah, even though it's simplified, I mean, it's like, this is the point that you get to. Sometimes simplicity is the most complex thing when you, when you really break down the individual steps in between. Um, the velocity of money today is so much faster than it was 15, 20 years ago. Um, access to capital is different. It's, it's easier and yet more difficult. So even when you're, you have these relationships with these private equity firms that have direct relationships, their capital could be tied up at any given point, or it could be more liquid than anything else. It's two different problems at the same time. How do you find the midway point to be able to coach and guide on how to generate inertia and that momentum to decide what to do? So we've gotten very refined. And this is important for listeners out there that are creating their brand, entertainment, business, whatever direction you're looking for. Mm -hmm. The reality is you can waste a lot of time with buyers that have an interest in you or investors that have an interest in you, but they don't have the liquidity or the cash. Sure. And I will tell you, ha, that's, no, it, ha, that's <laughs> half the managers and labels and music. But, and that's what's important about representation, guys. And it's taken over four and a half years for us to find a cultivated list. I would tell you 30% mm. of the firms that I spend my time with, 98% um, of my time is not with clients, they're with PE firms, family offices, okay. and money. Right. It's with money, money, mo money. Private no question about firms. it, private equity family. Yeah. But I'm vetting them to see who's full of it mm -hmm. and who's just out there that likes a business and ha they have to go search for the funds, who has the liquidity. I'll give you an example. I'll give a little shout out to Frank from Two Roads. Two Roads is a private equity firm that we work with, one of the many. I got an email from him the other day. I was just on a Zoom and I actually happened to pull it up. And he said, hey, Lee, what's up? I hope you're doing well in Atlanta. How was your July 4th? Just got our $400 million slug. We opened up our 11th fund. We just got our $400 million slug. He writes me an email because of our relationship. It's burning a hole in my pocket. He goes, now, I need industrial, industrial cleaning supply companies, electrical. They have that fund allocated for this for particular specific. industry, okay. these specifics. We take him, we put him in our system. I already had Frank in our system, but we, we particularly put that you know information in, the industries he's looking for. And we just keep adding to our list of who we know has the money. Mm -hmm. Now, you may not have a business that checks all the boxes of those PE firms. What they do, a little secret nugget, I'll open up the kimono for viewers out there. Yeah. You look at the PE firms, they have 400 million, 800 million, 1.3 billion. They spend upwards of 12 months building what they call their thesis. And this is some, this is some pro tips here. They spend 12 plus months spending a half a million to a million dollars using third party companies to build their thesis. And that thesis is I want HVAC companies. I want someone in the entertainment space. I want someone in the plumbing space. Is thesis synonymous with like portfolio or something? So a portfolio is what they may own multiple businesses. I might own a, a, I might own a recording studio. Mm -hmm. I might own a chemical company. That's their portfolio, it's what they yeah. own. It's like when you own stocks, you might own 10 different okay. stocks, that's your portfolio. The thesis is specifically crafted, and they spend, again, a lot of money, hundreds of thousands to up to a million dollars to build this. I'll give an example to make it easier. I know a firm very well that built this in the roofing space. Mm -hmm. So they want roofing companies. But mm -hmm. this thesis is built so specifically, they want them that have less than 20% commercial. Check that box. Less than 20% new construction. Check that box. So it's not just I want roofers. Yeah. I want to buy roofing companies that fulfill all of these check boxes. So what's the purpose of, of, of putting a thesis, of constructing a thesis? And you're like, what, what, what's, what's my goal? If I'm, I'm, what am I trying to yeah, achieve? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And I don't want to go thesis. too far down this road to bore Go down the, the audience. road. No, let's go down this. the yellow brick road. Guys, man. I have all the information. I, I see the every wizard. landmine here. This you is, are again, the wizard. 
you're too nice. Um, <laughs> it's, it's moving the arms, right? These little frail well, guy yeah, behind the scene. Well, no, I'm thinking of the, he's on down, but that's, that's, uh, that's a cultural uh, yes. thing. Well, Diana Ross, my, it's really go. the whiz. My gosh, there I asked you if I should see that in Atlanta. You told me it wasn't good. I disagree. First of all, to the to the uh, producers of that show and everything, I, I'd never seen it. <laughs> okay, so I'm not quite sure if those were the words that I said. I really want to see the whiz. I'm everything. Yeah, like I don't know, Lee. I didn't hear it was. Yeah, great. maybe I said I don't know, but okay, I don't know fair. if I said. It wasn't good. He's on Down the Road is one of my favorite songs, obviously. My, Nipsey Russell, Tin Man. I my mean, man. I can name all the characters. My man. Oh, my gosh, if, you, if you get a shot, see it. Grew up. Uh, Mike, Michael Jackson. You get a, was you get a stamp on your card. Okay. Yes, thank you. Okay. So <laughs> let's go back to what the thesis is yeah. and why this happens. So people talk about cash flow. I'm wearing the shirt, EBITDA, mm -hmm. earnings before interest depreciation. You, you understand what it stands for. It's one of the most important pieces. You taught me that term, actually. Yeah, but as a private equity company, I want you to consider their job is to do what? Their job is to make money. Yeah. So when they go out, they do what? It's called aggregation. So I'm going to continue to use the roofing. Which is not what the A stands for in any bit of It is not. It no. is not. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to discuss this continue to roofing. Okay. So if they go out and they're going to pay multiples, you've heard of that. Hey, I make a million dollars a year. I'm going to get a seven multiple. Right. So if my business makes a million a year, I can sell it seven. for seven million. I'm just simplifying it. That's generally how it works. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now I want you to consider they turn and they say, how can this PE firm pay a 7X for my business? Because their thesis, their thesis, pardon me, says the more that I aggregate, and if I get 10 of these together, that million dollars of EBITDA isn't a million anymore. It's 10 million, mm -hmm. regardless of growth. Gotcha. And I'm going to say something on the show. It matters. I'm going to do my best not to be sarcastic, but size matters in this space. Mm -hmm. well, size it, it matters. matters, period. Hey, matters wait, wait, wait. Spaces. Don't let anybody tell you that size doesn't <laughs> matter. Okay? Let's clarify that for those. Sure. There are those that want to know. We'll sidestep because we care about you guys. Yeah. It's not that size doesn't matter, because size matters. It's just not the end all, be all, okay? Because you can still get from your house to Publix in a Rolls Royce the same way you can a Fiat. You still gotta have but motion. But the experience in a Rolls Royce, it's a little, it's a little bit different <laughs> than a Fiat. That's all I'm saying. Fair, fair, and people are very different. Whoever's whipping that Fiat, <laughs> think. <laughs> But let's get back to the subject at hand. Fair, fair. So size does matter in these deals. Uh -huh. And when they're paying a 7X for a business, they have already aggregated in their thesis that they're going to get a 14 to a 16X. Okay. Okay. So there's another issue about rolling equity, and we don't want, I, I don't need sure, to waste sure. tons of time on it. But as you sell a business, you might get all cash. Mm -hmm. It's all about structure. Maybe you roll 10 or 20%. You get what's called a second bite of the apple, where you say, I'm going to continue to stay here, grow this. And my 10 or 20%, when they uh, yeah. sell it for 14, mm -hmm. I just made $7 million. I'm going to take six in cash, mm -hmm. and when this big business in the next five years sells, I'm going to make another, another seven. seven. Mm -hmm. yep. You know, and I'm going to make ten, maybe even more than what my first bite is to take chips off the table. Most business owners can see that. Like, there's a different world mm -hmm. when you're keeping your head above water and you're trying to make payroll and make your every mm -hmm. month or every quarter. Mm -hmm. But if you take some money off the table, well, how fun is that to run your business and go? I'm playing with the casino's money mouth sec Absolutely. second time around. So that's PE. That's family offices. The key is. Who really has the money and who doesn't is a big, big part of not wasting your time. Now, usually in most cases in life, um, but especially in, in entertainment stuff, whoever has the money has the leverage, right? And you mentioned earlier about how much emotion is involved in these deals. And the, re the reason why I bring Can that I up. Can I push back and disagree on that? Well, I'm going to give you the opportunity to. Fair. Because I'm going to ask you the strategies that you use. Um, so like in music, for example, um, you know, we talked about emotions being involved. A lot of times an artist, they'll feel that they're so amazing, their music's so amazing, and, and really at the end of the day, they want or need the money. So it will cause them to have a glossy or blurry view of this deal that's in front of them, and they're not really paying attention, because you were talking about having the right people on your team. And so they don't pay attention to all these red flags that I would like to say some of them are smart enough to say are going off in their gut, like something about this ain't right, or that's not really good for me. But they need that, they're looking at that dollar sign so much, like, but I need, I need to pay rent, and I need da 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 And so they go in and do this bad deal, right? totally emotionally driven. And the person giving them the deal that's giving them that check, they have all the leverage in this case. And so they, they tend to take advantage of that. If you were advising, say, the artist or the, the TV, whoever's on this side of the deal, right? How would you navigate that where you're dealing with someone who seems to have all the leverage? And then at the same time, correct me when you say just because you have the money doesn't necessarily mean you have all the leverage. It's kind of a two part question. Fair. No, it's a very, very good question, actually. And for people listening out there. Uh, so, number one, if you are treading water 
and, and there's not a boat in sight, like you said, using this analogy of needing the money, and there's a dinghy boat over here with a little raft that you're starting to lose, you know, lose your energy to keep yourself afloat. You, they got the leverage, and if there's no one else around, you got to take it and take the deal, right? See, so, and, and that, and I want to tell you, saying you got to take it. Do well, you if mean you, that, or do well, you, like, like, like I said, I'm using that analogy. Okay, you're going to sink or you're going to take that deal. Now, that's okay. the last, last effort here. That's not a okay. perfect analogy. My point is either you're going to sink and everything's over. Okay. There's no other way for you to get another dinghy boat to keep yourself afloat. You had to do what you have to do. Okay, so let's start there. All right. Secondly. Who has the money has the leverage? I would strongly disagree. I'm going to talk about the deals we do. We're batting a thousand over the past four and a half years for getting not only offers and offer for every one of are, our are you Are you being figurative by saying that? Or are you? We literally, literally are batting one thousand. Okay. For we've done over thirty deals in the past four years. We are batting one thousand for getting not only offers for every one of our clients. Getting here's the key. Hold on, multiple offers. Okay. So people always tell me, well, I'm on my business, I want $10 million for it. I want $20 million. I, we have a deal in play currently over $100 million. I have okay. five buyers coming in to town for over a $100 million deal, just to give you. And we have smaller deals for a couple million as well. But it's different when I have one buyer mm -hmm. or I have five or 10 behind the scenes wanting someone. And we do a proprietary auction process. Mm -hmm. Now, all these buyers have all the money. We have the talent. I represent the talent, the business owner. Mm -hmm. Right. So if I just go in the market and let one person make an offer and negotiate with one person, I have a lot less leverage. Mm -hmm. To your question, you say they're dealing with one person who has the money. Can I, before yeah. you say that, can I simplify? People have heard this term bidding war. Is mm -hmm. that more so what we're talking about? Is 100% creating auction, that? Auction process, bidding war. Okay. So remember, you know, getting a maximum enterprise value for a business or for a client or a talent it's not just I want the largest enterprise value. Enterprise value is 50% of it. The other 50% is the structure. Right, People yeah, tend to forget. Yeah, yeah. I mean, go look at Howie Roseman, our GM of the Eagles. I know you're a Dallas fan. I'm just saying. But look at <laughs> no, Howie Roseman. I'm not. I'm in. What? Wait, what? Oh, what sorry. Yeah, if you're not an Eagles no, no, fan, it doesn't matter. You're not an Eagle fan. So, yeah. You don't I'm remember I'm at the game. No, I know you're an no, Eagles fan. You're right. You're right. You're right. We've got three Eagles right here. You're right. You're right. You're right, Johnny. You're right. You're right. It is Eagles. No, 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 no. Sorry. When we went, when we had the game, Gerald's a big Dallas fan. Thank you. There you go. Sorry. Gerald is Stone's brother. Gerald. So, all that being said, guys, Consider the fact that, you know, you you have more leverage the more people you get into the game. I want you to that I agree with. Well, I want you to apply it to your home, for example. Let's mm -hmm. just say Stone, your home is worth just for argument's sake, a hundred thousand dollars. Right. You're going to sell your home. Mm -hmm. Your neighbor comes knocking. Just think about this for listeners out there. Your neighbor comes knocking on the door. You know your home's about a hundred grand. They mm -hmm. say Stone, I'd like to offer you a hundred thousand right now for mm -hmm. your home. I was thinking about selling it. This is not a bad idea. Okay, it's so easy right here. Now, what if I took? What if we didn't do that deal? I took your home. I staged mm -hmm. it. I've repainted it, staged it, did beautiful aerials, and I looked, and also, Stone, you're located in Tennessee. Let's just use an example, because the states of Florida, Tennessee, Texas have no state tax. Right. Mm -hmm. The value of your home, just because of the location, forget about the value of the home proper, but then no state tax versus someone in California paying 13.3, mm -hmm. they're gonna value your home different. I bet if I had 10 people bidding on your home, like that moment, remember when the real estate market was blowing up back then? Right. You're gonna get more than $100,000. I want you to consider that the, the person with the money doesn't always have the power if the talent and the product is enough to attract more than one person. All right, so going back to my example, because where the bidding war is scenario is concerned, 100% agree with you, right? And most artists or people would love to have labels bidding for them. But let's take it to a one-on-one. -on -one. It's just one buyer, one interested person, right? Who, in that case, do you think has the leverage? Well, so I do have to step back again. I'm not okay. dancing around your question, no, okay. right? I'm not dancing around your question. Um, number one is, we talked a little about value and structure. Mm -hmm. Right. So 50 50. Mm -hmm. Sometimes in a deal, 51 percent is value that matters more. Forty nine percent is structure. But it's all how it's paid out. I talk about Howie Roseman, you know, at the Eagles like, oh, I got a 300 million. Oh, he's only paying a million here, five million there. The structure matters a lot as well. Secondly, if you're an artist out there, business owner or artist, your job is to become the most appealing for multiple buyers or investors. Sure. So, yeah. so that's first and foremost, even more than your talent is I want to get two or three people interested in me so I can start seeing what the market's going to bear because I could think think my firm or my talent is worth $10 million. Which they always do. Yeah. But, but, and that's okay. And it's a longer process of psychology of the deal. Of I mean, this could be 10 hours of a meeting. The point is, I watch my clients all the time that say, I need $10 million. And then I go out and I get four offers at $6, 7 and $8 million. 
What do I say? Mm-hmm. I don't have to say anything. Mm-hmm. I still think it's worth 10, but but I've got three qualified offers at six, seven, and eight. Mm-hmm. And suddenly someone starts to realize, and I think I sent you that, you I did. joke about the five stages of grief. Yeah. It's just so important about the anger, the denial, the, the negotiation, of finally acceptance, and people have to go through that process. So I'll, let me circle all the way back. I like having multiple buyers or interested parties. It gives us a true market value of what that investor would be putting into you or buying a business. Mm -hmm. Gives you a little more negotiating power, obviously. You know, I've done deals very much where someone's offering $5 million for a deal and the other two people are offering $2 million. Mm -hmm. I'm never going to let them know all those details, but I'm like, oh, this this one's really the the best one for us. But if you really have nobody else Mm -hmm. and you really only have one, then your other leverage is how bad do 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 you fit for them? So I have an example of a... um, it happens to be a roofing company again. I'm using the roofing <laughs> companies. But I have a roofing company that makes good money. Okay. They have a great business, but they're smaller. I know that once I put them in the marketplace in the next few weeks, that I might get three or four offers. I called a larger roofing company's aggregator, the PE firm, mm-hmm. that's located in the respective near zip code okay. that I know would want to bolt them on. So strategically, and I don't want to lose you here, I know this is a perfect fit for them. They called back and said, Lee, we are so interested in them because we now get to expand because I know all the underworkings of what matters to these PE firms. Sure. So I understand that they're the big player. They're an $8 billion PE firm. I know they want and need this client of mine. So although they have the most money stone, like you said, I know there's a perfect strategic fit for this client. So, so interpretation. Interpretation is if I'm you're, talent and you're and, you're a rapper. Yep. And you're going to a label who has ten other rappers. Mm-hmm. Eh. One you're, in a million, you're, right? You'll bolt in there. You're an R and B singer. You're going to a hip hop label that wants to expand exactly. into the R and B genre. It. You got it. Yeah. Now you have something. Now leverage is more on your. So side. you ha- that's where you would have advisors, a manager, that their job is to do this, right? You're mm-hmm. still making your music. You're producing your stuff. How much information can you do, right? And yeah. then you also say, we talked about another thing about I need to keep, you know, I need money to keep growing and producing my content. Mm-hmm. Well, there's two ways to go about it. You can give up your leverage, and you can bend, t- take it, bend over backwards for them, take whatever they offer you, or I'm going to do my career. While I'm going to get a second and a third part-time job, and I'm going to maintain control and leverage because I don't need you. Right. Mm-hmm. So there's Woo! a yeah, no, but there, there's, stone language right yeah, there. but that's that's my point, guys. <laughs> it all depends on how much. If I need you, I'm stuck. To answer your question, mm-hmm. I don't like situations where I need you because that's not a win-win deal. So the deals have to be win-win. Okay. People are going to be happy in the deal, and people are both going to be unhappy. I had a question a little, a few steps back that this kind of leans into too. Um, I've seen situations where qualified buyers have approached private equity firms to get into a situation. Yes. And they've teamed up to bid the prices down on what true market value. To elaborate of, on that a little bit. Yeah. Let's use your, let's say you're trying to sell this $8 billion company. Um, and let's say you get three or four companies that are interested. They know what the market value of it is. And they know that they're all going to be bidding on the same thing. And they agree to come in and bid lower than what actual market value is. In your position, how would you deal with a situation if you've got your potential buyers working against what you know Good, the value right, of the so company is? So we've never run into that. So number one. So I'm making stuff up. No, okay, no, no. And it's cool. fair. So, so no, no, no. That's great. That, that would never happen. Let me explain why. Okay. Um, anytime we engage a client, and this is where you get good representation, mm-hmm. our client, our buyers are all under NDA. Okay. They don't know who the other buyers are. Awesome. They would never know who the other buyers are, nor would buyers really want to work together in that regard as well. So I understand what you're thinking, and I'm not going to go into the litigious nature of that's probably sure. illegal anyway for them to go uh, work together. Which is why I asked the question. It's a great question. I'm not a lit lawyer, but I'm 90% comfortable that leans a little more litigious. However, okay. anonymity is most important in confidentiality, so none of my buyers know who the other buyers yeah. are. Okay. Here, here's the best part. We do it subtly. We always have a modicum of tact when we do things. Mm -hmm. And as we're developing our bidding process, we create what's called an FAQ, Frequently Asked Questions, because everybody wants to get into the details Mm -hmm. of this this talent or this client that we have. So all of my buyers, let's just use five buyers in this recent situation. They start asking lists of questions. One asks five, the other asks five. We build a master FAQ sheet that has everybody's questions on it, and we answer them all. Mm -hmm. Then we distribute them to everybody. Smart. We don't tell everybody there's other bidders. Yeah. But but Johnny, let's just say you gave me five questions. I'm like, Johnny, I happen to have 25 answers and questions for you to help you determine what offer you want to make. Mm-hmm. You suddenly look at the list and you said, mother, what? I only asked these top five. Who are these other 20 from? 
well, we all know what's happening. Yeah. You're not alone. Right. Yeah. You know, right. You're not alone. Now, we also say, listen, we're ready to make a decision of the direction we want to go, Johnny. Uh, we'd love for you to come in and spend three hours with our client, then have a dinner afterwards, right? Oh, I could, no, 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 those slots are already taken, Johnny. Can you do this time and this slot? Oh, I'm not doing it rudely. It's just a matter of we have a week's worth of time where, you know, multiple interested parties, which we discuss, no names are said. Um, this is the slots we have for you able to do that. You damn well, these billion dollar businesses suddenly work their schedule and appear at that time. Sure. Because now they realize I'm in a race with other people. So you're exactly right, son. They have all the money, but I have multiple buyers. Now, in circumstances which are rare where I only have – I've never had a circumstance where I have one where I only have one buyer. I just know in circumstances I have some really bad buyers. I always say I've gotten multiple offers. Yeah. I've gotten some really bad ones, and I've really got – I've had them where, like, that's the best one unequivocally. But I'll never, never let them know they're the best one. Right. But I will be honest that there are other people interested. So even if it's bad – advice – even if it's bad other buyers, mm -hmm. I never want to lie. You never want to lie. Always be honest. Mm -hmm. it's, it's okay to say I have three interested Still people. Other people. Yeah, it's, I, it's I the do. truth, though. I know the other two suck, yeah, but yeah. Uh, I'm not going to tell them that. that right. But I honestly have three people that are interested. Mm -hmm. So I, since emotion gets so involved in this thing, I can see, I mean, especially when you're dealing with that much money. And then if you're dealing with stuff like music or art, where it's a heart thing, right? How much emotional intelligence is important. Like, for example, is there ever a time where being sympathetic or being apathetic is advantageous or being empathetic? Like, what kind of emotional intelligence is involved in the whole thing? So let's start first with trust. Let's start first with trust. Okay. First with trust. I've known you guys for a while, by the way, mm -hmm. right? But our podcast today would be very different if this was our first time and it was on Zoom and we never met each other. Sure. So let's start there. Facts. Okay. We wouldn't be able to really talk. I'd make some inappropriate jokes, as I always do. You guys would look on the screen and go, what the hell's wrong with him? Stone would get butt hurt. Yeah, like, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I, you backed out of one earlier, by the way. I just wanted to big up on oh, you on I'm that. Oh, I'm sorry. No, you did the whole bend over thing. I was like, here we go. But yeah, then yeah, you cleaned I it up. It. I was like, look at this guy with Thank the you. emotional <laughs> intelligence. You saw that. You saw that. And I like the reference of when I was bending over, I was backing out of it. Too. Exactly. Well yeah, was yeah, good yeah, thanks for Elaborating, but no, you're the one that brought it back up. So, uh, <laughs> as we size matters, um, so, <laughs> I will I will say this: um, we work with people all over the country. I represent people all over the country. As I mentioned, we're very fortunate. We we are told consistently from the private equity firms across the country, we have some of the most deal flow in this country already at our firm. This is exit stage left. Exit stage left advisors. Right. Right. We have over 24 clients under agreement. We have seven LOIs and other clients are in different phases. LOIs. So we, I'm telling you, we, LOI is letter of intent and we can get into IOI and LOI, but our experience isn't just vast, it's very diverse because we represent all different industries. Mm -hmm. We'd be representing someone in talent. That's not an issue. We represent all different industries. Uh, with that in mind, the moment we meet somebody, the moment we're doing Zooms, which are very common, mm -hmm. once someone engages us, and I'm not a flyer, Stone, you know that. I fly once a year if mm -hmm. I'm lucky. Not anymore. Once someone engages us, I'm on a flight. I've done day trips or evening trips. I'm on a flight and I spend half a day with someone in person. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is we need to build the trust. Mm -hmm. Let's start right there because I talked about us doing this on Zoom versus us being together. Sure. And and I, I know that um, our team is amazing. I, there's something that you, you tend to be good at. I talk to my partner's very analytical. I'm very good about other things. When I spend four hours with you at your home or wherever we choose to meet and I leave, every one of our clients is like, that guy cares about me. Mm -hmm. He knows our history. He knows my partner and my history. And he knows that a deal is not necessary to put money in our pocket. It's for a win-win because we, we've done okay in our career, but our focus is to take care of our clientele. Right. Mm -hmm. When I spend four plus hours with you, which is just about enough, that's the limit. You don't want me too much. But when I spend four hours with you in person and you walk away going, I'm going to follow you wherever you need me to go. I'm going to, I'm there. That stone is the baseline that matters most because now as we go through the EQ, the process, the emotion, and you and I are on a Zoom in the middle of a deal and I've got you three or four opportunities and you're like freaking out and you're, ah, and I say, stop, J just stop, listen, this is the best thing I think, mm -hmm. right? I'm gonna f you're the client, I'm going to do whatever you say, but I'm going to kick and scream behind the scenes and give you four reasons why it's a mistake. And I will tell you 99 times out of 100, it hasn't happened yet, I haven't, but I don't like to say 100%, everybody's like, damn, you're right. I said, just get back to me tomorrow. Just chew on it. Don't do anything today. What's the rush? I start slowing all these entrepreneurs down because you're in the middle of it. You're a, you're a talent. You need yeah. the money. Mm -hmm. Remember what I said to you? Go get the second or third job at night. Don't lose our leverage. Don't go, go alone against something. Don't lose our leverage. We need some form of leverage. Not just, it's not to take advantage of the situation. It's to level the playing field against the big players yeah. out there. 
Now you, you uh, <laughs> I'm I'm laughing because you say against the big players. You you are a big player. Um I represent the, the man against the against big the big players. Yep. A part of those deals, one side is is we want it to be a win win, but one side it's never really a win win all the way. Someone's gonna come out with the better side of the deal. How do you make sure that your clients that you're representing aren't getting washed by the deals that are coming this way? So it's really funny. Number one is if it's the right deal that firm wants you to be successful. So as you're growing and your product talent business mm-hmm. is expanding, they've been allocated these funds already. They need to spend it. Let, let me explain. You just spit bars. Did I? I just had to repeat la, 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 la. If it's the right deal, that company wants you to be successful. Listen, I got like, an email the other day from Frank so that said true. this is burning a... When someone says I got 400 million, mm-hmm. let, let me also give you guys a perspective, and this is what I do all day long. You have a department at a PE firm, private equity family office, that just got allocated $400 million. Mm-hmm. Now, they could take the $400 million and go put it into whatever bond, get 3%, 4%. Mm-hmm. That is called dry powder. And that dry powder sitting in that account, the six, seven, eight people that work in there are not doing their job if that money is not being deployed. Mm-hmm. If it's just sitting there for the year. So their whole company just made a thesis. Their whole company said, here's $400 million. We just raised it. Now go double, triple that money for us. Mm-hmm. What do they have to do with it? They Call have to stone. deploy it. Mm-hmm. So when you say, you know, someone's losing, no, if it's the right fit, they're winning. And by the way, if it's the white, right fit, pardon me, mm-hmm. watch out. Because I'm about to put my, the pedal down and I'm very courteous and nice, but if I know it's the right fit, I want it to be a win-win, but at that point, you got enough money. I want my client to get a little more on the upside. Mm-hmm. The only other concern, to be frank with you, I've had clients that have some had some illnesses. I've okay. had clients that have to get out of their business for reasons other than I'm trying to get the largest enterprise value. Sure. And the timing is important, whether it be retired or family that are sick. Mm-hmm. So those deals, I need it to be a win for them, but I will take it on the chin sometimes because they need a transaction. Right, right. And and by the way, you know, whether they're getting eight million or seven million, when they need a transaction, I'm not gonna split hairs and make sure they're getting seven point eight right. versus we need a transaction and maybe the seven point three in all cash mm-hmm. with a small five percent hold back. Versus nothing in the business, you know, these people can't even work in their job anymore. So there is a happy medium there. I don't mind doing that because it's not even taken to the chin. They need a transaction mm-hmm. to be done. It isn't common, but it goes both ways. Let me ask you a question. Do you have a strategy that you use in particular when you're trying to persuade someone to agree to a deal that, you know, you're getting pushback from or you guys are b- bumping into some kind of conflict? Do you mean the buyer or the person selling or getting invested? The buyer. The buyer. So you're representing me, the seller, and you're with the buyer, and you're trying to get the buyer, you're trying to persuade the buyer to this, these deal terms or whatever. All day long. What kind of strategies do you use to try to make that happen? So, so this is strategies for life, not just that deal. What's important to that other person? Stop thinking of, get out of your own head. Get out of my head that I said, I want to take care of Stone, and I want to take care of myself, and we got to get a deal done. So no matter what, this is the best, and you got to buy them. Mm-hmm. It's a preposterous way to look at things. Mm -hmm. It's a preposterous way to be married, have business partners, have friends, and just have life in general. Just so happens to be the way most of us do all of it. And that's okay because if you can change your fundamental mindset, not only in business but in life, you're going to thrive across the board. So I am constantly thinking, well, here's an example. I, I don't mean to compliment myself this morning, but I brought a gift in for you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. I take it. But I brought a gift in for you guys, right? Because we all watched a football game last year. Go uh-huh. Eagles. Yeah. Go Birds. Go Eagles. Um, and, and we all made fun of me because I come roll. I didn't come in with alcohol or all the stuff that most people do. I come rolling in with Manchango. Cheese. Yes. Yes. Cheese. 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 Cheese.
the same cheese and the same crackers for you because I'm trying to think in your mind, what do you guys want? Not to what, not what do I want here? What do I want you guys to have? Mm-hmm. So starting to look at it from the perspective of the investor, why do they want that talent? Why do they want that business? As you said, it's an R&B singer. They want to make a platform into the R&B space, out of the rap space. So there's so many segments to this. What is the nugget of why they're even looking at you? Right? Don't convert who you are, mm-hmm. but try to figure out that right buyer for that and mm-hmm. what's important to them. So an example, Say I had somebody that wanted to roll in. They said, I'm in the rap space, but I want to get into the R&B space. That kind of deal where they're going to get a platform of somebody new, I'd say, we'll roll equity. We want a little money off the top and we want to roll equity. You're going to make a platform. So we're going to both be vested in this. I would create a structure. If, if you were looking to open up a studio and you're a rap and you want to open up the R&B space, I wouldn't say go invest here and just, you, you know, you're going to own all of it. I'm going to say our client is going to roll equity with you. Now you're both aligned. You're holding hands as you grow this entire division. So it isn't that this man or woman that's gonna produce R&B for you is gonna produce Mm -hmm. good stuff. They're also Mm -hmm. gonna be highly vested in this entire R&B division. Because Johnny, I'm thinking about what's important to you. Right. And I'm thinking about that equally as much Mm -hmm. what's important to our client. Throughout this whole thing, I've been asking questions from that standpoint of doing things by yourself. Because most, we talked about this in the beginning, most entrepreneurs fail because they don't understand that team building process. That's been intentional, but this, right here leads into having to do it together, that holding hands with partners that actually do it. Um, marrying those partners up, I know building that thesis is a big part of, of doing that. Do you ever have to help your clients with that spot, with that process, or do they come to you with that already? So let, me, let me share, and I'm, I'm gonna answer that with another example, okay? okay? Um, I said we're batting 1,000 for getting multiple offers. Mm-hmm. We almost weren't. We were in the batter's box ready to leave at one point. We have a client, uh, I won't mention the names, but we have a client that makes their EBITDA, their profit, close to $4 million. Okay. What a successful business. So many buyers want to buy this business. I can't really mention the space. Mm-hmm. But as we went into the marketplace, lines of buyers lining up. We had seven buyers at the end of it all ready to make offers for that size business that should easily sell. Mm-hmm. Zero offers. I'm going to explain. Remember, I said I'm batting a thousand because I'm still in the batter's box. I have not knocked out zero offers. But a year into this, we got with a client and said, "Listen, listen, you have no offers, and let me explain why. This is what we heard from the buyers, from the investors or buyers. You're losing seventy percent of your business every eight months. So there was a lot of recycling of their clients. You're losing seventy percent of your business every eight months." I could probably go in the marketplace and sell 30% of your business because of that recurring. And and I would tell, I said, but guys, we're going to let you out of our agreement. We, you know, we don't have to represent you anymore. The market is telling us that there's a fault in your business. You're making great money. They said, we love you guys. They said, what we've done, and this is about a year into it, is we've changed our entire business model. We now have all of our clients sign a 12, 24, or 36 month agreement for us. Nice, nice. And remember what 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 a buyer, what do investors, private equity, M and A, what do they want when they're investing in talent? Recurring. They, talent. they want recurring. They want this key word, predictability. Uh, when I'm investing, okay. I want to know it's going to be here. So they changed their entire business model. We're launching them in the next month. So excited to put them back in the marketplace. So we're still in the batter's box with them, but they fixed all of the problems that the market told us. Mm. So kind of going back to your question about- To match the thesis of what's up. Yeah, I mean, look, if you got a great talent in the R&B space or the rap space or whatever it may be, but there's something that you're just not doing right, and you get to hear from the market about what it is consistently. I didn't Mm -hmm. say two, I said seven buyers amongst our 700, 750 PE firms, they made a pivot. They didn't have to. They could have put their head down and say, we're going to make $4 million a year, and that's and just what we're going to do, and we just keep fighting every do. year to build it, and we do what we do, which is perfectly fine. So there is a an exponentially growing wave of dissenting comments about where rap is going. And the whole, it all sounds the same, it all looks the same, it's not saying nothing, da-da-da-da-da. And to your point, that's the voice of the market. And if I'm going to speak to rappers out there, listen to the freaking market. Because they're going to be like, oh, this is what I do. I'm the best at it. And they think they're the best at it. We can go back into that whole conversation again. But to what you just said, the reason why you guys have a second chance with this company, and chances are it's probably going to blow, you listen to what the freaking market said. Well, it's they like, have a second chance. It's not even well, I mean, Well, I'm saying yeah. you because you represent them. But yeah, they're listening to the market. And I, I just kind of want to bring that home to some of our core audience is that 
I don't care what you turn, listen to now, everyone from Jay Z to, to J. Cole's, all of them, they hate where the rap game's going, but they still have new kids coming in the rap game doing what everyone else is doing when the market is like, we're tired of it, mm -hmm. to your point. So I just kind of want to translate that into. Some Speaking music of rap speak. game for our, our yeah. age guys. Uh, as Molly Ryan and I were driving over here, I said I need some I need some music. I need to feel it right now. And I did put on something. She's like, Oh, I'm into the let's say older rap, mm -hmm. right? But I played my favorite, which I, so years ago I went. I think we talked about this. I'm I so went to a right concert. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it's, it's such a classic. I went to a concert years ago with a couple guys in college in Philly, okay. where I grew up. Good girl. start. Yep. And and <laughs> and the, the band was called. Uh, I'm gonna say you tell me the band's name. Hear hear me out. Uh, two lead singers, JoJo and KC. Oh, uh, yeah, Jodeci. Jodeci, and they were on a backtrack of a rapper. Ooh, which one though? Tupac. How do you want it? How do you want it? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that we were just jamming on. Like I just think, right okay. like I don't hear I don't hear rap like that. I can respect that. I, 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 I don't that. hear that exact that exact one. Uh, Quote we the fears. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't know he was coming out with some vanilla. Oh gosh, no, no. It was my it was one of my go to. Uh, no, well, you had Eminem your playlist. Was one of the goats, but you know. It's, yeah, but you, you your playlist has Eminem leading off, and we were working out the other day. Hey, lose yourself, homie. No, I know. I, I still think Tupac was better with how, how do you want it. But I'm not mad at that. I think um, we could do this for seven hours. And Dude, the, the amount of content I'm scratching. I, I, for for I, viewers out there, I just implore you, I've shared so much random information about the process. This wasn't a structured presentation like I kind of have, which right. helps take people. This is such a deep process. I, and you're, I know you're going to end. I just want to share this. I'm not into um, anything. It is, is who do you want to follow? Mm -hmm. It is be considerate to others and think of their needs ahead of yours because mm -hmm. it'll come back. Don't change, you know, don't change who you are. If you are a rapper, don't change just for the marketplace, but put a different spin on it. Mm -hmm. Do something a little more unique. Listen to the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Don't change who you are. Please, mm -hmm. that, that would, then you're just being fake, not authentic. Right. But if you can't look at what other people's needs are and see how you fit into those needs, not how everybody fits into yours, that's what I'm doing all day long is listening to my buyers and, and understanding what's important to you mm -hmm. and do I have something that fits into that shape for you? Mm -hmm. That's so, even the last podcast, you predicted my questions so fluidly. You're predicting. For the, well, I can be sometimes. Some people <laughs> listening to the marketplace and adjusting to that. I, I always try to ask these questions from the place of the little guy because most of our listeners aren't playing with a million or a hundred million or 10 million. They haven't seen those numbers before. Um, and also don't know how to get out of the tunnel vision of being able to only see what they're offering. Hmm. When there's a person out there like you, that's that bridge between people who may want to acquire or buy into what you're doing. How does the person that has that business, that newly minted entrepreneur, step back from the tunnel vision and be able to assess the things that they're doing to be able to more position themselves for what the market is asking for. Yeah. Because a lot of people, I mean, I can look at the, any industry that we're at and say, this is what it's missing, this is what I want to provide, and it'd be completely wrong. How do you analyze that? How do you actually build a, a process to take yourself out of this is what I'm doing that is wrong, and I don't know that it's wrong, to aligning more into what you would be able to work yeah, with. Yeah, so high level. Your emotions a, first. But yeah, yeah. Uh, well, first the two things. We talked about that choose your own adventure book. Sure. We talked about the bifurcation. Mm -hmm. Are you in a business to grow and exit, or are you in a lifestyle? Mm -hmm. So first to determine that. Decision. If it's a lifestyle business, just keep doing what you're doing. If mm -hmm. you like it and you enjoy it, you know, if you're making your rent and making your payments, then you're good. Right. If you say, I want to grow and exit this business, that's a little more on you. Get with the right groups. Remember, you are, you know this, I'm not saying anything new. Everybody says this. You know, you are a product of the people that you surround yourself mm -hmm. with. So start surrounding yourself with the people that you want to be like, right. number one. Number two, let's talk about the exit, right? You're like, I'm looking for that exit. You're going to need, w without any questions, a minimum, uh, and this sounds hokey, you're going to need a minimum of a million dollars of profit in your business moving in that direction. You look and say, how could I ever get there? But when you're there, you're going to realize, how do I get to 10? How do I get to 20? I, I will say this about an exit. And I was in a room. We were in San Diego. Uh, we speak a lot on M&A. I had a room of a couple hundred people in San Diego. And unbeknownst to me, a couple thousand were streaming it. And my partner and I were speaking on it. And when you have a room of a couple hundred people, you get to see their reaction. And these people represent clients. They're CPAs and financial advisors. So all their clients have businesses mm -hmm. in some level of different degrees of success. And I looked across the room and I told them, most of your clients will want to sell their business, most likely when it's flat or it's decreasing. Because you've been doing your business for eight, nine years, and you're like, man, I'm just spent. Mm -hmm. I'm exhausted. I've had enough of it. It's time for me to sell. And I will tell you, listeners, listen in right now. The worst 
freaking time to sell. Yeah. Why is that appealing if it's flat or going so, down? Right. Yeah. Nobody yeah. wants to catch a falling knife. Right. Nobody, <laughs> nobody wants to catch a falling knife. When your business is thriving and going up and to the left, or up and to the right, no, up and to the right, pardon me. When your business is thriving, oh, I'm making money, I'm flush. Why in the world would I want to sell it? What PE and family offices want to buy is predictability and growth. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's quite this antithesis. And if you have a plan, you stick with it. So if you say, hey, how do I get to $100,000 of profit? How do I get to a half a million of profit? You have to reverse engineer and map those out. Then obviously, as you get larger and larger growing your business with surrounding yourself with those people, then you start looking into experts like myself or somebody to go, hey, how do I get an investor? How do I do a potential exit? But you try to sell a business that's $100,000 of profit, which is awesome. It's gonna. It's a mess. That's like a listing on an MSL, a MLS, yep. you know, housing page. Mm -hmm. Don't waste your time with that. I'm just being completely frank. Focus on doubling down and growing your business. I like mm -hmm. your falling knife thing. That was that was that's better than me. I was like, don't wants to catch a falling no, knife. Yeah. Well, no one wants to date someone who gains weight. So, <laughs> where uh, where can people find? Because we could be here for like. Ten hours. Seven hours. I, again, you know guys, I, mean? I just look. It was high level of so many things, <laughs> and that's what we like. We and, appreciate and again, that. Tying it back into the entertainment business, I agree with you. You've got to have a niche. It's got to be mm -hmm. different. But listen to the market. You're a hundred percent right. And w it, look, you said he, you used a lot of terms, a lot of examples. I want to encourage you guys, please, when you're listening to this, anything that he says, pause it. Right, hop on Google, Gemini, ChatGPT, and like find out what it is, the meat is, or what he said. Any term you heard, anything, an example he used, you don't understand. Pause it and go search. It'll it works wonders. Trust me when I say. Where can people find you just to follow you, follow your business or anything? Because you, are you on social media much? So I, I do my best not to be on, okay. which is a shame. <laughs> but, but I am finding myself more on LinkedIn. Okay. Um, you know we have our ASB and the roadmap. Yeah. On the yes. you know uh, Hulu TV now, which mm -hmm. is wonderful. Great show to watch. Um, so I'll be frank with you. Email is the best. Lee at ESLadvisors.com. And I'm, if there's any listener here that truly has any question, it's never a waste of time. I will meet with any. If you make ten dollars a year in your business, if you're an entertainer in some way, and you don't have a direction you're working three jobs per man that that's the person i want to talk to more because they're wow. hungry wow. so lee lee -E at esl advisors and where can they watch asbn the roadmap yeah that is on asbn network asbn.com okay. uh, the atlanta small business network which is great you were a guest don't no these you have great interviews on there like seriously yeah. that's like we've, that's we've a been great very very watch. fortunate with that but i'm imploring any listeners out there you know i may have used terms again i live in this world sure. but it doesn't matter if you're losing 50 grand a year I'll talk, dude, I'm not about the dollars and cents. That stuff comes with time. Mm -hmm. I'm here to help anybody. And if they're a fan of, or, or a listener of this show, it's you guys. You're just a, a extended family of you guys. So I'll do anything for anybody. And you already know that. Yeah, if yeah. I get 50 people reach out to me, I'll get back to every 50, yeah. every one of the 50. Facts, big facts. Yeah. We're gonna find I have, you. Uh, where am I? Just Johnny Vaughn, J-U-S-T-J-O-N-Y-V-A-N, all over the stuff. Y'all already know, nice and simple. Stone <laughs> Stafford, S-T-O-N-E. Stafford. Uh, <laughs> everything here, you can listen, watch, subscribe, comment on lifeonpodcast.com, your favorite platform, whatever it is you want to do. Make sure you like and subscribe, though. Y'all, look, thing is, I'm going to stop saying y'all don't understand how much that helps. You know how much that helps. All right. So can you just do what you know and like and subscribe and then maybe tell a friend? All right. Can, can, can you just help a brother out? That's, that's all I'm asking. That's all right, one red for a dime. Thank all right. You. We love y'all. We out. Peace. So back to what I was saying.